Welcome back, guys. Once again, just want to take this opportunity, Liberty. Thank you for making this show possible. And then on your smartphone, the Tenfold Education app. Go and download it. Lots of goods on it. Okay, we'll definitely help you with the preparation for your final exam. And go and give us a like on YouTube, Mindset Learn. A lot of uh, past videos on there, not only on this subject, but other subjects as well. Now, just before the break, we looked at rural settlement patterns and we discussed dispersed. Now, I just want to add to that and I want to have a look at this infographic that's been given to us with sketches. Just pay attention to this, right? A, we can identify a subsistence farming, right? And B, as commercial farming. Okay, nine out of 10 times when we look at dispersed settlements, big settlements, right, for dispersed farming settlements, right, when you see a hell of a lot of cultivated land, right, it's usually commercial farming. Now what is commercial farming? It's there to make a profit. These are the guys that, where they provide food security for South Africa. These are the guys adding to the GDP, paying taxes. Okay, most of the time, farms are mechanized, you can see tractors being used, right? They use genetically modified crops, for example. They use uh, genetically modified crops. They use new uh, innovative farming methods to produce more. And a lot of technology is involved in that as well. Now, when we look at subsistence farming, it's mainly, if you look at the concept of subsistence farming, is to farm for yourself, okay? Is to provide only for yourself. So subsistence farming is labor intensive and they don't focus on one specific product or crop. They farm a little bit with everything. Subsistence farming is only to provide for you and your family. Still vitally important because it provides food security for whoever is farming that. But when we look at subsistence farming, we mainly see that with nucleated patterns. And when we look at commercial farming, it's usually dispersed patterns. Okay. And going back, and I want to have a look at our second one, settlement type. As you can see, we have a village. Once again, the key is being used, right? You can see the buildings are very close to one another, right? So we immediately can identify it as a nucleated pattern. Right, you can see a river, right? That might be the only river in the surrounding area. So we can identify that as a wet point settlement. They are very close to the water resource, right? And as you can see, the cultivated land is not as big as our previous figure that we discussed. Now, when we look at our nucleated patterns, right? And this is a circular pattern, right? As you can see, we can even identify this as a dry point settlement as well, because they are far from the floodplain, right? Because they might be prone for flooding. Right, now as you can see, they've mentioned dirt roads, not good transport roads as well. Now, in the case of nucleated settlements, right, there's some advantages and disadvantages regarding these patterns. Now, the majority of the time, subsistence farming are being practiced. Now, a plus with this type of farming is these farmers can share equipment. Okay, so expenses will be less because they will be able to share expense, uh, the equipment being used. But one of the disadvantages is if they are commercial farmers, profit 
will have to be shared. Okay, we can also mention, right, that irrigation can be shared. And as you can see, it's a nucleated pattern with the village green that forms the central part of this village, right? It can improve infrastructure. And service delivery. Because they are close together. Whereas with your dispersed settlements, the people are so far from each other, it's very difficult to get services to them. But moving on to this sketches that I showed you. And I just want to answer a couple of questions regarding that, if you look at subsistence farming and be commercial farming. Right? And a couple of questions give one term that best describes the type of farming at A. Right? The subsistence farming, very importantly, you can see it labor intensive. It's not mechanized, not new technology being used, etc. Okay. Give one term that best describes the type of farming at B, that's commercial farming. Oh, spelling there wrong. Okay. Now, just a couple of true or false questions. Uh, not true and false, just show use scientific farming methods. That's definitely going to be the commercial farming, right? Genetically modified crops. For instance, contributes most to the GDP, that's also going to be B, because it's commercial farming, like I explained it to you, right? Products are being grown, right? Not only for, uh, for inbound use, but also for export use. For instance, our wine industry, our sugarcane industry, where a lot of the products are being exported, right? If you look at the next one, produce a variety of crops in small quantities, that's going to be Subsistence farming, right? 3.1.6 uses machinery, so we're taking high techno type of machinery is going to be B as your commercial farming. And 3.7 as limited capital outlay, that's your subsistence farming. What they don't use for themselves, they might sell to the local community, but it's not like commercial farming where they can go and do loans, borrow money from big financial institutions. So the correct answer will be A. Okay, and last but not least, like I've mentioned before, before aimed at the export market, that will be B, it's commercial farming. Okay, now grade 12, the next questions, topic that I wanna discuss with you is map work. Okay, now, Map work is going to be in question one as well as in question two. Now, yes, there's going to be some calculations, interpretations regarding map work. Now, I've seen that the majority of the learners do struggle with the map work section. And we're just going to have a look at the basics for you to be able to answer the most popular questions that they tend to ask in the map work section. Now, first and foremost, as you can see, Right, just going to point a couple of things out. They've given us now the new maps that's being distributed is on the same page as on the A3, as you can see. On the left hand side, you have your topographical map, consists of a scale to 1 to 50,000. And on the right hand side, you have a scale of 1 to 10,000. Okay, just a couple of pointers. Right, in this case, we're discussing Louis Trichard, the map of Louis Trichard. We can see the map code, the map extract. Okay, just a couple of points. 23 stands for latitude. 29 stands for longitude. Okay, the BB is the grid reference. It comes in big block and small block. Very easy to see it, 
pay attention to the top left hand side corner. There you can see the 23 degrees and on top you have the 29 degrees that shows you the latitude. As you can see that's your latitude over there. Moving from west to east. And your longitude moves from north to south. So that's your horizontal lines. Your latitude is your horizontal lines. Right? And your longitude is your vertical lines. Okay. Now, in the bottom of it, you can see that the magnetic de declination has been provided in the bottom left-hand side corner. And if we look in the autophoto, you can clearly see the contour lines, but pay attention, you can see that the contour interval is only 5 metres. On your topographical map, your contour interval is always 20 metres. Okay. Now the first question I want to discuss with you, I just want to wipe this out. How to calculate distance and area. And I'm going to make it really simple by just showing you. Because we're working on a topographical map and on an autophoto map, so de dealing with formula. On a topographical map, we know we've got a scale of 1 to 50,000. And on an autophoto map, we've got a scale of 1 to 10,000. First and foremost, when we need to calculate distance, we use the following formulas. For kilometers on a topographical map, we times our centimeters with 0 0,5. If I want my answer in meters, I times it with 500. On an autophoto map, if I want my answer in meters, I times it 0 0,1. In kilometers, 0 0,1. If I want my answer in meters, times 100. So let's just quickly do an easy example. Let's say the examiner asks you to go and calculate the distance from K to M. OK. You use a ruler, right? And you measure the distance from K to M. And you've got 10 centimetres. And they, answer, they want your answer in kilometres and in metres. So the correct answer when you do the question calculation is 10 centimetres times 0 0,5 equals. Now, just want to use my calculator, right? It's 10 times 0 0,5 and our correct answer will be 5 kilometres. Now, if the examiner asks the question in meters, to provide your answer in meters, 10 centimeters times 500. And once again, you use your calculation, calculator because you're 100% sure. And the answer will be 5,000 meters. Okay, that's the formula that you need to use to calculate distance. Now on the autophoto, let's assume the examiner asks you to calculate the distance from 5 to 6. And you place your ruler between 5 and 6 and you measure the distance and you get 15 centimeters. Okay. In this case, and they want to ask you to calculate in kilometers, it's 15 centimetres times 0 0,1. Use your calculator once again. 